In the year 1917, on a hillside near the village of Fatima in Portugal, the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared six times in successive months to three shepherd children, Lucia de Santos and her cousins Francisco and Jacinto Marto. The Blessed Virgin's message to the children, which was a message to be given to all mankind, was that man must cease offending God, for he is already too much offended, that great punishments will fall upon the world if man does not do penance, and that God wants to establish in the world devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Our Blessed Mother asked at Fatima that the faithful pray the Rosary every day. On October 13, 1917, she performed the great miracle of the sun, witnessed by 70,000 people, which, over a period of about 10 minutes, the people saw the sun dance in the sky, plummet to the earth, and return to its place. Even the anti-Catholic press at the time reported the details of the miracle. One of the most intriguing aspects of the Fatima message is the third part of the Fatima secret, the so-called third secret, which was given on July 13, 1917. The first two parts of the secret, Sister Lucy recorded in her memoirs that she wrote in August 1941. The first part described the vision of hell that she and her two cousins saw. And the second part of the secret concerned devotion to the Immaculate Heart. Sister Lucy would not write down the third part of the secret, but subsequently gave what appears to be the beginning of it. In December 1941, she wrote, In Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, etc. The rest of the third secret had yet to be put down on paper. In June 1943, Sister Lucy became very ill. She became so sick that by September, the Bishop of Fatima was worried that she might die. And he was concerned that she might die and not write down the secret, the third secret. And so he went to her and suggested to her that she write it down so that the secret would be uh, not published at this time, but at least it would be there for the record. And Sister Lucy became quite concerned. She felt this was a tremendous responsibility. You see, the bishop had only suggested, and the bishop was not taking responsibility. If she thought it was a good idea, is how he put it, something like that. And so Sister Lucy thought about it and told the bishop, if you give me an order, if you give me a formal written order to write it down, I will obey. But I cannot do this on my own. I cannot take this initiative by myself. So the bishop thought about it for a month and he prayed about it. And so in October, he in fact wrote the formal command to tell her to write down the third part of the secret, or as it's known, the third secret. Sister Lucy, as soon as she got the order, immediately set about to obey. And she tried for all of October, the rest of the month, all November and all December to write down the secret. She could not bring herself to put pen to paper to write down the third part of the secret. Finally, on the 2nd of January, 1944, in the chapel in Tui, Our Lady appeared to her and told her that indeed it was the will of God that she write down the secret. So Sister Lucy wrote down the secret and by January the 9th, she wrote to the Bishop of, of Fatima that I have not completed the task you set out for me to do. In 1957, just before the envelope containing the third secret was sent from Portugal to the Vatican at the request of the Vatican, Auxiliary Bishop Venancio found himself alone with this envelope. So he held the envelope up to the light to see what was in it. And holding that envelope to the light, he could see that the third secret was on one sheet of paper and it consisted of about 24 to 25 lines. Sister Lucy wrote the first part of the secret, The Vision of Hell. She, in this inner writing down the first part of the secret, she tells us that she was so frightened, and her cousins also, that they trembled with fear, and that she concludes that she herself would have died of fright had not Our Lady uh, cut the vision short, and had not she been promised to be taken to heaven. So it was a terrifying thing for her to see, and yet she could write it down with apparently relative ease compared to writing down the third secret. And she wrote in the second part of the secret about the the annihilation, that is, she used in other, in other parts of her uh, writing or speaking, she said that 
various nations will disappear from the face of the earth. She understood that the annihilation of nations is something terrible. And she could describe this without very much difficulty. But to write down the third part of the secret, she could not do it for more than two months. Without the intervention of the Blessed Virgin, it must be something terrible. The two envelopes containing the secret were ultimately transferred to the Vatican in 1957. Sister Lucy had written on the outside of each of the envelopes that the secret was to be opened and revealed to the world in 1960. Canon Barthes writes about his meeting with Sister Lucy in 1946. She was with the Bishop of Fatima. And Canon Barthes asked, when will the third part of the secret or the third secret be released? And they both said, 1960. He asked, why 1960? And they both replied, because the Blessed Virgin wishes it so. Now in 1955, Cardinal Ottaviani met Sister Lucy on May 17th. After he'd been to Fatima, he went to Coimbra. And there he asked Sister Lucy, why 1960? And she answered, because it will be clearer. In January 1959, Pope John XXIII announced the forthcoming Second Vatican Council. In August of the same year, after having read the secret, he was reported to have said, the third secret does not concern the years of my pontificate. Thus, 1960 came and went, and despite the Virgin's explicit request, the secret was not revealed, even though the entire Catholic world was awaiting its publication. In February 1960, a high Vatican official made an anonymous report to the press, stating, it is most likely that the letter in which Sister Lucy wrote down the words of the Virgin, which Our Lady confided as a secret to the three little shepherds, in the Covita era will never be opened. It is most probable that the secret of Fatima will remain forever under absolute seal. Cardinal Sarajera, the Cardinal Patriarch of Lisbon at the time, expressed his disappointment. I affirm categorically that I was not consulted on this subject. What I did know of its non-disclosure in 1960, I learned through the papers. Cardinal Sarah Gera, who was Patriarch of Lisbon, held the most exalted place in the Catholic Church in Portugal and was well known for his fervent devotion to the Fatima message. Yet, even though Pope John XXIII had consulted a number of prelates regarding the Third Secret, it seems Cardinal Sarajera was deliberately shut out. This is particularly troubling since Cardinal Sarajera was certainly the most knowledgeable of all the prelates about the details and events at Fatima. Yet the Cardinal learned that the secret would not be released, not from anyone in John XXIII's Vatican, but from the newspapers, just like everyone else. Like the Cardinal, Catholics the world over were stunned and subsequently disillusioned by this development. We all had this very big in our consciousness and we knew 1960 was coming. 1960 was the year the third secret was going to be revealed. The first time I heard of Fatima, I was a Protestant boy in Eau Claire, Wisconsin and the year was 1960. I was a school patrol fellow and walked around with my flag protecting my fellow students and was chosen to go to Washington, D.C. on a special trip. And I was getting ready, going on the bus, driving in the car with my mother, and uh, heard on the radio that the third secret of Fatima would not be revealed, that the Pope had read it, and it was decided by the officials in the Vatican that it would not be announced to the world. And we waited, and we waited, and still nothing, and nothing, and nothing. Um, there was an almost audible silence about the thing. People were disillusioned, I think, eventually. We all had a sense that perhaps we'd been had. In fact, I remember the feeling. I can only describe it as a kind of spiritual desolation when I learned that the decision had been made and the third secret would not be revealed. What was written in the secret that the whole world was waiting to hear? Was there something to hide? A first clue as to its contents is to be found in the year of its intended publication, 1960.
she has said it at the very latest it had to be revealed by 1960 and when she was asked why 1960 she said because then it would become more clear uh, that was the decade that changed the face of the world and changed the face of the church so it's not at all surprising that she, she chose that year and said that uh, in that year things would be clearer because, I, because with very, in, a very, in a very short uh, time frame, uh, disasters would happen to the world and to the church, to the families, to our Christian society. Does the third secret indeed predict disasters throughout the world, and in particular portray a crisis within the church? A crisis of faith? Sister Lucy herself provided a key clue when she wrote the following in her fourth memoir. In Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, etc. In September of 1952, Pope Pius XII sent a priest named Father Joseph Schweigel to interview Sister Lucy in Portugal on the Third Secret. This is a specific interrogation about the Third Secret. And when Father Schweigel came back, here's what he said. He said, I cannot reveal anything of what I learned at Fatima concerning the Third Secret, but I can say that it has two parts. One concerns the Pope, the other logically, although I must say nothing, would have to be the continuation of the words, in Portugal the dogma of faith will always be preserved. When Sister Lucy said that the, um, the faith was going to be preserved in Portugal, that implies that the faith is going to be destroyed in most other places. Uh, that's the clear implication, and I think we've, we've seen at least one or two generations of young people in which the faith has been totally lost. And we all knew how the third secret began from Sister Lucy's writing, you know. In Portugal, the dogmas of the faith will always be kept. Obviously, the implication is that outside of Portugal, they might not be kept, you know. It doesn't take a genius to figure this one out. Anybody could figure that one out. Obviously, any investigation into the true contents of the third secret of Fatima would have to begin with the telltale phrase of the Virgin of Fatima. In Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, to which Sister Lucy added, etc. Within that etc. is a world of meaning. Within that etc. we will probably find out what happens to dogma in other parts of the world outside of Portugal. And we will also find out the full contents of the Third Secret of Fatima. So our investigation has to begin with the question, what is contained in that etc.? Fatima scholars are in agreement that within the mysterious etc., one will find the words of the Virgin Mary, which predict a great crisis of faith within the Catholic Church, a loss of dogma outside of the nation of Portugal, and an apostasy reaching even the highest levels of the Catholic hierarchy. And this is confirmed by those who have actually read the text of the Third Secret. Cardinal Alfredo Ottaviani was prefect of the, uh, of the Holy Office. And at the time, the Holy Office was the preeminent dicastery of the Roman Curia. Uh, he was the one who pronounced an orthodoxy and also had the jurisdiction over the final approval or disapproval of apparitions. He stated in, his, in an address he gave in 1967 at the Antonianum that the third secret of Fatima is set forth on one sheet of paper. Cardinal Odi said that the third secret has nothing to do with Gorbachev. Our Lady was warning us against the apostasy in the church. Uh, Bishop Amor do Amaral of Fatima in 1984, he said the third secret has nothing to do with atomic bombs or Persian missiles, it concerns the faith. Cardinal Mario Luigi Chappi uh, was a Dominican priest who had been made a cardinal by Pope Paul VI. He was a papal theologian under Paul VI, John Paul I, and early in the reign of Pope John Paul II. Cardinal Chappi uh, stated in his letter to Professor Baumgartner that in the third secret, it is revealed, among other things, that the great apostasy in the church will begin at the top. Father Joaquin Alonso, who died in 1981, was the official archivist at Fatima for 16 years and had many conversations with Sister Lucy. Here is what he had to say about the secret. 
It is therefore completely probable that the text makes concrete references to the crisis of faith within the church and to the negligence of the pastors themselves and the internal struggles in the very bosom of the church and of grave pastoral negligences of the upper hierarchy. One of the most important testimonies regarding the contents of the secret came from an interview given by Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, now Pope Benedict XVI. At the time, he was the prefect of the Vatican Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and as such had access to the secret, and he read it. Cardinal Ratzinger, in his 1984 interview with Yezu Magazine, he said that the third secret concerns the dangers to the faith to the life of the Christian and therefore to the life of the world. Does this crisis of faith, identified by the witnesses who have read the third secret, have anything to do with the Second Vatican Council? The council began scarcely two years after 1960, the year the third secret was supposed to have been revealed. Given the period of unprecedented upheaval and scandal in the Catholic Church following the council, a growing number of Catholics are convinced of a link between the Third Secret and the Council and its aftermath, especially the changes in the Catholic Mass, which began in the early 1960s. In the 1930s, when he was still Vatican Secretary of State, the future Pope Pius XII made an astonishing prophecy about the upcoming upheaval in the Church. He predicted with terrific degree of accuracy just about everything that was going to go wrong in the Church. And his prophecy is recounted in the biography of Pius XII by Monsignor Roche. Let me read to you from that prophetic remark. I am worried by the Blessed Virgin's messages to Lucy of Fatima. This persistence of Mary about the dangers which menace the Church is a divine warning against the suicide of altering the faith in her liturgy, her theology, and her soul. I hear all around me innovators who wish to dismantle the sacred chapel, destroy the universal flame of the church, reject her ornaments, and make her feel remorse for her historical past. A day will come when the civilized world will deny its God, when the church will doubt, as Peter doubted. She will be tempted to believe that man has become God. In our churches, Christians will search in vain for the red lamp where God awaits them. Like Mary Magdalene, weeping before the empty tomb, they will ask, where have they taken him? So about 30 years before the Second Vatican Council, the future Pope Pius XII predicted everything that would go wrong during and after the Council in the Catholic Church. He predicted drastic changes to the liturgy, so drastic that people would not even be able to find the sanctuary lamp in Catholic churches. He predicted theological changes. He even predicted this movement in the church to make the church apologize for her own past, as if the church were to be ashamed of everything that had gone before and should feel remorse for it. And he linked these predictions to the message of Fatima, which is very interesting, because none of the words of the Virgin of Fatima, published to date, contain any reference to these catastrophic developments in the church. Clearly, Pope Pius XII was referring to a portion of the message of Fatima containing words of the Virgin Mary, which we have yet to see. It's curious that, that Pius XII, he, he made a, an interesting comment when he was still Cardinal Pacelli about Sister Lucy and the upcoming events. He, he mentioned that uh, there, was a, there would be attempts by people to destroy the faith by altering her liturgy and faith and these other things, but liturgy was first on the list. I remember my mother uh, had been away from the church for a while. I got her to come to a mass and she had a very hard life. Her mother had died when she was young. She was put out to foster homes. First time she saw the, the new mass, she said, oh, I know this. I was living with some Presbyterians for a year once and this is what they used to take me to. Cardinal Ratzinger at one time stated that the new liturgy of Pope Paul VI was a banal, on the spot fabrication. So he was rather blunt in his opinion of what he thought of the new liturgy of Pope Paul VI. He didn't think much of it. What's very clear is that with the changes that took place in the church after the Second Vatican Council, there were enormous changes in the liturgy. 
it is it is long been stated that um, the way in which we pray connects directly with what we believe. If there was an attempt to change the belief system of Catholics and mainly to open them up to the modern world, to make the modern world more acceptable to them and to make the modern world more accepting of Catholics themselves, everyone hoped there would be a great glorious hootenanny. Instead what happened is Catholics abandoned their faith, abandoned the church, went rushing off to the world. There are lots of dangers to changing the liturgy, especially in a, in a radical way. First of all, the, the sense of stability that people had from knowing what to expect is gone. In fact, from, in a period there from the mid-1950s onward, not only were the people subjected to change, but probably more important, the, the clergy were subjected to change to the point where they, they didn't know what was coming next themselves and they kind of stopped caring because they couldn't keep up with it. It's like, okay, this week they want us to do this, this week they want us to do that, let's just do whatever. Uh, I, I remember one of, one of the first bizarre masses we had in 1965 at my parish church. Afterwards, people were exiting the church and they were unsettled. But I remember this old woman on my street saying to another old woman, they lived down at the corner next to each other, she was saying, well, I guess it's better now that it's in English. But they seemed doubtful. And everyone was saying that, but everyone was ceasing to go to church. Elements of Protestantism, uh, both in the symbolism and in the wording uh, of the liturgy, were brought into and mixed into uh, a Catholic framework to the extent that uh, the makers of the new rite flatly stated that this is no longer the Roman Rite, it is a new creation. I would sum up the effect of the changes of the liturgy in the last 40 years on, on the faithful as there's no more faith in the faithful. Even Cardinal Ratzinger, who was now Pope Benedict XVI, said that the liturgical changes which followed the Second Vatican Council were a breach in the history of the liturgy whose consequences can only be tragic. But the crisis in the church also includes other changes. In his prophecy in the 1930s before the Second Vatican Council, the future Pope Pius XII spoke not only of the suicide of altering the faith in the church's liturgy, but also in her theology. And here we see emerging in the post-conciliar period the theological novelty of the modern ecumenical movement. The priests began talking differently, using strange language we'd never heard before. They started talking about dialogue and being ecumenical. Vatican II brought in the new era of ecumenism. The church always taught that there was only one true faith, one true church outside of which there's no salvation. And the purpose of Catholic churchmen and missionaries is to go forth, teach all nations, and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, and bring them in to the one ecclesia that our Lord established. But with the Second Vatican Council's new ecumenism, they set up a, they adopted, I should say, a different form of church oneness and church unity that you can trace it point by point that came actually from the Protestant World Council of Churches. The priest that was the moderator for the Forensic Union, the debate team that I belong to, g jumped into this with both feet. He joined something called the Confraternity of Christians and Jews, which was designed to demonstrate the irrelevance of dogma in life. Unfortunately, when we speak of ecumenism, we're not simply talking about propositions, doctrines set forth in the documents of the Second Vatican Council. There are consequences uh, to these teachings because these are not something that are simply considered in the classrooms theoretically. The Promulgation of the, of the uh, decrees on ecumenism and religious liberty uh, have, have spawned in the church a, a new orientation in the church, an opening up uh, of interreligious dialogue, uh, encouraging Catholics to become involved uh, with members of other churches and other religions in such a way that has caused great confusion and even loss of faith among the Catholic people. What it leads to, I think, is a, a very good concrete example is the desecration of the sanctuary of Our Lady of Fatima. 
that took place a couple of years ago when the rector, Monsignor Luciano Guerra, invited the Hindus and a Hindu priest into the shrine of Our Lady of Fatima. And they offered, and the, and the Hindu priest wearing Hindu vestments performed the pagan idolatrous ceremonies of Hinduism on the Catholic altar at the shrine of Our Lady of Fatima, at the Capalina, the little chapel, the place where Our Lady appeared. There are no other churches that our Lord would found as a, as a, as a means to salvation. There is only one religion. God cannot reveal different religions with contradictory ideas about himself, about the, the way how to save one's soul. So to accept this unity in plurality means to reject the Catholic Church and Catholic religion. It goes together. The new church has become ecumenical, as I call it, and turning anywhere and everywhere to embrace all of the religions. The only thing in the modern church that is not acceptable is tradition. See, the thing is, all you need to do is look at what happened to the church after 1960, and it's fairly clear what the third secret is, what Our Lady wanted us to know in 1960. It's clear. The real secret has to do with the collapse of the faith coming from the upper hierarchy. And we know this also because the two things that we see from Sister Lucy that bracket the third secret, 1957, the famous interview with Father Fuentes, when she says God is about to punish the world. And the way God is going to punish the world, she says, is there's going to be a great loss of faith among priests and religious. Then, after the third secret was supposed to be released, around the end of the 1960s, She's talking about a diabolical disorientation of the upper hierarchy. So these two messages, these two warnings from Sister Lucy bracket the third secret, the collapse of, 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 of priests and bishops who are going to, uh, to stray from their vocation. And you don't stray from your vocation by leaving necessarily. You stray from the, your vocation also by staying in and corrupting the faith from within. And then she talks about precisely that at the end of 1960, a diabolical disorientation of the upper hierarchy. These are the things we have from Sister Lucy that bracket the year 1960. Lucy of Fatima, she described what's happening in the world as, as the effect of a diabolical disorientation. I, th I think this, this diabolical disorientation is associated with the third secret. Uh, basically on the evidence of, of knowledge of people who've written about it, who have some insight into it, who've had some experience on the higher levels of the church uh, with people who have read the third secret. I believe that when the secret was opened, there was, it was clear that this secret was about the apostasy in the church and that this would be brought about by a change in the mass and uh, by a council. And therefore that was exactly obviously the plan of John the 23rd to call a council he had already made the preparations and to uh, alter the mass in some way uh, in line with these new teachings that were to be promulgated by the council and therefore a rebuke to the Pope a, a statement that if these things are done disasters shall come to the world and to the church and the faith shall be lost throughout Europe I think that's uh, what was uh, very shocking for him, and uh, that ex to, in my mind that explains his stark response, and a response that uh, should not have been given, this is not for our time. Well, it was precisely for our time. Our Lady had said it was for our time, and it was for him. Besides speaking of the spiritual crisis within the Catholic Church, does the third secret speak of a divine chastisement of the world at large? None other than the former Cardinal Ratzinger, now Pope Benedict XVI, has confirmed that it does. In the 1984 interview in which Cardinal Ratzinger spoke of the third secret, he said, The things contained in this third secret correspond to what has been announced in Scripture and what has been said again and again in many other Marian apparitions. Cardinal Ratzinger's revelation in the 1984 Jesus Magazine interview that what is contained in the Third Secret corresponds to what has been said again and again in other Marian apparitions is very significant. 
because in the other Marian apparitions he refers to, there is a reference not only to a spiritual crisis in the church, but to a divine punishment of the entire world. And one of these apparitions, approved as authentic by church authorities, is the apparition of Our Lady at Akita, Japan in 1973. In this apparition, Our Lady speaks of a twin chastisement, a chastisement within the church consisting of a crisis in faith and morals and discipline, and a divine punishment of the whole world. And at Akita, she gave some terrifying details about the nature of that divine punishment of the world. And by choosing to appear at Akita on October 13, 1973, the very anniversary of the miracle of the sun, Our Lady was sending a message, unmistakably connecting the Akita apparitions to the Fatima apparitions. In 1973, at Akita in Japan, the Virgin Mary spoke to Sister Agnes Esagawa, a deaf nun. While praying in the chapel, Sister Agnes witnessed a great light surrounding a wooden statue of Our Lady. Sister Agnes then heard a voice coming from the statue, which delivered three messages to her. The first in July, the second in August, and the last and most important message on October 13, 1973. Our Blessed Mother warned, the work of the devil will infiltrate even the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops against other bishops. The priests who venerate me will be scorned and opposed by their confreres. Churches and altars sacked, the church will be full of those who accept compromise, and the demon will press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. In the same message, the Virgin further warned that not only the Catholic Church, but the whole world will suffer the consequences of this loss of faith. She further said, if men do not repent and better themselves, the Father will inflict a terrible punishment on all humanity. It will be a punishment greater than the deluge, such as no one has ever seen before. Fire will fall from the sky and will wipe out a great part of humanity, the good as well as the bad, sparing neither priests nor faithful. The survivors will find themselves so desolate that they will envy the dead. After a thorough investigation by Bishop Ito, the bishop of the diocese in which Akita is located, the message of Akita was approved as being worthy of belief. Howard D., the Philippine ambassador to the Vatican, said in a 1998 interview with Inside the Vatican magazine that Bishop Ito was certain Akita was an extension of Fatima, and Cardinal Ratzinger personally confirmed to me that these two messages of Fatima and Akita are essentially the same. Over a million people from all over the world came to Fatima on May 13, 2000 for the beatification ceremony of Jacinta and Francisco Marto, the two Fatima visionaries. During his homily, Pope John Paul II referred to the Great Red Dragon in Chapter 12 of the Apocalypse. He said the message of Fatima is a call to conversion, alerting humanity to have nothing to do with the dragon whose tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and dragged them to earth. Then came the surprise announcement. Cardinal Sudano, the Vatican Secretary of State, announced to the pilgrims that in the near future the third secret would be officially revealed. He then spoke of the secret containing the vision of a bishop clothed in white who shortly after making his way amid the corpses of victims falls to the ground apparently dead, under a burst of gunfire. The Cardinal went on to claim that this was a prediction of the 1981 assassination attempt against Pope John Paul II. Many in the audience applauded, but some were perplexed. On May 13, 2000, Pope John Paul II went to Fatima, and there he gave a very short homily, but he referred to chapter 12, verses 1, 3, and 4, of the Apocalypse. And in fact, he told us that the message of Fatima is for our time and telling us to be on our guard against the tail of the dragon, which is dragging down a third of the stars of heaven. Clearly, this language is not found in the published parts of the secret that I know of. 
it must be in the secret. However, Cardinal Sudano, shortly after the Pope finished his talk, gets up and announces that the third secret will be released in the near future, but he suggests that it refers to an event in the past. Now here we have Pope John Paul II telling us it's about our time, it's a warning for us today, and we have Cardinal Sudano telling us, well, it's in the past, it's about the assassination attempt. Cardinal Sudano, in the year 2000, was the Secretary of State. Now his job is dealing with states, diplom diplomacy, and things like that. The matter of Fatima is a matter that is really the competence of the Office of the Doctrine of the Faith, and that was Cardinal Ratzinger's uh, position. Now, I don't understand why Cardinal Sudano was the one making this announcement, when Cardinal Ratzinger, as far as I know, was present at the same time. However, it was Cardinal Sudano that made this announcement. Why was he making this announcement? And why was he, what was he preparing us for? On June 26, 2000, the Vatican released what it claimed was the entire text of the Third Secret of Fatima, which consisted of 62 lines of text written by Sister Lucy on what appeared to be four sheets of paper. Those four pages, which contain no words of the Blessed Virgin Mary, present an ambiguous vision. An angel is holding a sword that gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire. The flames are repelled by the Blessed Virgin. Then a bishop clothed in white, apparently the Pope, is seen hobbling through a half-ruined city filled with corpses. The afflicted Pope makes his way to the top of a hill outside the ruined city and kneeling before the cross, he is killed by a group of soldiers who fire bullets and arrows at him. And in the same way, there died one after another, the other bishops, priests, men and women religious, and various lay people of different ranks and positions. Two angels gather up the blood of these martyrs and sprinkle it on the souls making their way to God. The Vatican commentary on the purported secret suggested that this vision pertains to the failed assassination attempt on John Paul II on May 13, 1981, in which the Pope was not killed. Given the lack of any explanation of the vision by the Blessed Virgin herself, Catholics were widely skeptical about the completeness of the Vatican's disclosure. How could the Virgin Mary have remained silent on the meaning of the Third Secret of Fatima? According to the Vatican's interpretation of the Third Secret of Fatima, which is essentially Cardinal Soldano's interpretation, this ambiguous vision of the bishop in white being killed at the top of a hill before a, a large wooden cross is basically all there is to the Third Secret of Fatima, and it relates essentially to the assassination attempt, the failed assassination attempt in 1981. The only problem with this attempt at an interpretation is that it fails to mention any of the things that Fatima scholars, those who read the Third Secret, anyone who had any knowledge of this matter, knew were involved in the Third Secret. The loss of faith in the Church, the liturgical changes, all of the things talked about in the prophecy of Pius XII about the suicide of altering the faith in the Church's liturgy, theology, and soul, the apostasy in the Church that begins at the top. There isn't a single reference to any of this in the Vatican's interpretation of the Third Secret. And why is that? Because what they published in June of 2000 doesn't contain a single word of the Blessed Virgin Mary to explain the vision of the Bishop in White. She is utterly silent on the contents of the Third Secret, and that doesn't add up. You know, Sister Lucy said that the secret should be opened in 1960 because it would become clearer then. Then we were told in 2000 that the Third Secret was about an assassination attempt against John Paul II in 1981. Why would an assassination attempt in 1981 become clearer in 1960? The Vatican put out its interpretation of the third secret of Fatima in the year 2000. If it had been a plebe paper that I had received from one of my plebes in the freshman English course at the Naval Academy, I would have flunked it because the interpretation does not in any way correspond with the facts. I gave a talk one time on the third secret and I read word for word what was released in the vision. And then I said to the audience, 
And the Vatican's interpretation of this is that this is a prediction of an assassination attempt against Pope John Paul II. And I have the recording. The audience laughed. The audience laughed at it. Because at face value, it's just nonsense. And does the Vatican's interpretation of this vision make any sense? Well, uh, Sister Lucy explains in her own words uh, uh, how she understood uh, this vision, or what she saw. She depicted what she saw. Uh, this bishop in white, white, who was presumably the Pope, is, is shot and killed by a band of soldiers. Uh, the Vatican's interpretation is that somehow this refers to the assassination attempt on the life of John Paul II, of course. Uh, there are problems there. We, John Paul II was not shot by a band of soldiers. He was shot and wounded by one lone gunman. Uh, I think that alone is enough to, uh, to dismiss uh, the Vatican's interpretation uh, as, as being nonsensical because it simply does not add up. It makes no sense. It just it doesn't make any sense that there would be so so much fuss and weeping and gnashing of teeth on the part of people who saw the third secret before that if it was about an assassination, assassination attempt which wouldn't succeed anyway. It's so silly. Even the New York Times looked at it and went, huh? The Washington Post said very clearly, look, Cardinal Sedano said that the Pope falls apparently dead. But the vision of the secret leaves no doubt of what happens to the Pope. It says he's killed. So, Your Eminence, you weren't being honest with us. You gave us a falsified picture in order to force fit your interpretation upon it. There are very specific images in what they claim is the third secret. Their interpretation does not match it at all. There's other things the Washington Post pointed out that, that doesn't jibe. First of all, that the Pope uh, in the vision is killed by a group of soldiers, uh, but in, on May 13, 1981, there was not a group of soldiers, there was a single gunman. And the Post said, in the vision, cardinals, bishops, priests, lay people are also killed, but on May 13, 1981, no one else was shot at except Pope John Paul II. A man in white climbing a hill who is shot with bullets and arrows and falls dead is not someone who is shot with a gunshot and recovers. It does not connect. It's not solid or even intelligent interpretation. And, and the idea that this Bishop of White walking through a ruined city, through the bodies of his priests and prelates up to a hill where he's going to be assassinated, you know, had nothing whatsoever in common with Aliaga, you know, taking a couple shots at, at John Paul II in St. Peter's Square. There, there was nothing, there, there was no correspondence between the events. For example, what is the half-deserted city, the half, the desolated city? What does that mean? Does that mean an atomic war? Does that mean, is that an image of the church? That's not made clear at all or spoken of. There's just overwhelming circumstantial evidence to indicate that we're dealing with a two-part secret, as Father Schweigel said, involving two distinct texts. It's so obvious that even Italian television commentaries are talking about the theory of le due buste, or the two envelopes, to use the Italian phrase. It is impossible not to notice the number of discrepancies between what was known about the secret prior to 2000 and what was revealed on June 26th of that year. We know that the Vatican said in 1960 that it was not going to reveal the third secret of Fatima to the world as expected. And in making that anonymous announcement through a press agency, it referred specifically to, and I think I'm quoting verbatim, the words of the Virgin which she confided to the three seers. So there was a specific reference in 1960 to the words of the Virgin in the third secret of Fatima. And yet the text published by the Vatican in June of 2000 involves a vision of the Pope in white being shot down and so forth, in which we find no words whatsoever uttered by Our Lady of Fatima. None. So already we have a major discrepancy. There must be a text, the one referred to by the Vatican back in 1960, that contains words of Our Lady confided to the seers. There is a discrepancy regarding when Pope John Paul II first read the third secret. This is an amazing discrepancy. It appears that Pope John Paul II 
read two different texts of The Secret, one in 1978 and one in 1981. And it was the Washington Post, the July 1st, 2000 Washington Post, that pointed out this discrepancy. Here's what it said. Contradictory statements from Vatican officials about when the Pope first read The Secret added to the confusion. On May 13th, Vatican spokesman Joaquim Novara Valls said that the Pope first read The Secret within days of assuming the papacy in 1978. On Monday, June 26, 2000, an aide to Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, prefect of the Vatican's Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, said that the Pope first saw it in the hospital after his attack in 1981. This is yet more evidence that we appear to be dealing with two texts. Another discrepancy surfaces from Bishop Venancio's 1957 testimony regarding the secret. We know that when Bishop Venancio held the sealed envelope containing the secret up to the light, he saw inside that envelope one sheet of paper. But the text produced by the Vatican in June of 2000 consists of four sheets of paper. So you have two texts, one a handwritten single sheet and the other four pages of handwriting. Another discrepancy surfaces from Bishop Venancio's 1957 testimony regarding the secret. When the Bishop of Fatima held that sealed envelope up to the light, he saw what he estimated to be about 25 lines of text on that single sheet of paper. The Vatican's text produced in June of 2000 contains 62 lines of text, 25 lines in one, 62 lines in another. Clearly, we're dealing with two different documents. There is also a discrepancy regarding where the secret had been stored in the Vatican. We know from press coverage in Parry Match magazine that a text of the Third Secret of Fatima ended up in a wooden safe in the papal apartments in the 1950s. We know this because a picture was provided in Parry Match magazine showing that very papal safe. And yet, the Vatican tells us in June of 2000 that the text of the Third Secret they were producing at that time had been stored in the Holy Office archives, a totally different location. Once again, we're looking at two texts. And finally, the question must be asked, where is heaven's explanation of the secret? We know that when Our Lady spoke to the Fatima Seers, she explained everything that they saw. Even something as obvious as hell, she explained to them. She said, and I quote, you have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. Now, it was obvious they had seen hell. They saw souls burning in hell and floating about in the state of agony and yet she explained that to them. But here we have this ambiguous vision of a bishop of white with angels in, an angel in heaven sending fire down toward the earth, the pope being executed by a band of soldiers outside a half-ruined city, the pope processing through the ruins of the city with dead bodies of clergy and laity alongside him, and absolutely no explanation of Our Lady. There were a number of things in that document that gave the appearance of trying to undermine the Fatima message itself and even undermine certain doctrinal points regarding our Blessed Mother. First of all, all Catholics know that the Immaculate Heart of Mary is the heart closest to Christ. There's only one Immaculate Heart because Our Lady was the Immaculate Conception. She's born free from original sin and she, in her entire life, she was free from actual sin. There's only one Immaculate Heart. But the June 26th commentary when it mentions Immaculate Heart, first of all, it puts it in lowercase, lowercase i, lowercase h, something Catholics never do. And it implies, it basically says that an Immaculate Heart is any heart that says yes to Christ. Now, this not only undermines the Fatima message, but it also undermines the Catholic doctrine itself on the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Second, our Blessed Mother said at Fatima that in the end, her Immaculate Heart would triumph. But this June 26 commentary implies that the triumph of the Immaculate Heart took place 2,000 years ago when Our Lady gave her fiat to the angel at the Annunciation, when she consented to be the Mother of God. So what this commentary does is it takes a prophecy of Fatima, of Our Lady of Fatima, that's supposed to take place in the future, it puts it back, it kicks it back 2,000 years ago so there's no longer a prophecy. This is an undermining of the Fatima message. Another thing, the June 26, 2000 commentary says, and I'm going to quote it, that the concluding part of the secret uses images Lucy may have seen in devotional books and which draw their inspiration from ancient intuitions of faith. 
Now this appears to be a subtle way of suggesting that the entire secret of Fatima was not something that Lucy received from heaven, but just there were ideas that came to her while she was reading devotional books. And this is a bogus argument that enemies of Fatima have been using for years to try to discredit Fatima. And worse, one of the most troubling aspects of this entire commentary is that the only Fatima expert that is quoted in the document, so-called Fatima expert, is a priest named Father Edward Donis. Now, Father Donis was a modernist Jesuit who throughout the entire 1940s and 50s and even beyond that, made a veritable career of trying to discredit Fatima. He cast doubt on any revelation that Lucy received after 1917. Uh, he implied that Lucy invented the Fatima secret. And other Fatima scholars at the time tried to convince Donis that his thesis was, was wrong, that he was mistaken. And after World War II, they even invited him to come to Fatima, come to Coimbra, interview Sister Lucy, so that he could check the primary documentation, interview Sister Lucy, and, and get his facts straight. Father Donis refused to go to Fatima, he refused to go to Coimbra, and he, he refused to meet Sister Lucy. And during this time, a true scholar named Father Hubert Jeddon, talking of Father Donis, he says, is this really the mark of a sound critical mind? Yet Father Donis was the only so-called Fatima scholar quoted in the June 26 commentary on Fatima. So it's no wonder that the June 27th Los Angeles Times, a secular newspaper, said regarding the Vatican's treatment of Fatima, it said the Vatican's top theologian gently debunked the Fatima cult. Those in the Vatican who are uh, possessed of this modernist way of thinking feel greatly threatened by the message of Fatima. And since they cannot suppress entirely what the church has approved, they therefore seek to debunk it by uh, putting a new spin on the message to reinterpret the message, to make the message appear to be in agreement with their modernistic manner of thought. The so-called revelation of the third secret in June 2000 was a disappointment to myself and to many people I know because it didn't match the expectation. We were expecting something, a uh, significant statement which would surprise us in a way and would explain why the Vatican had kept that secret uh, under wraps for, for 40 some odd years. And um, what they revealed clearly didn't uh, meet expectations. Obviously, I believe that it was part of the, the third secret, but there was some, there's something missing. There's some explanation that's missing. The question has been asked, was the Vatican lying to us when they released the secret on June 26, 2000 and said, this is the whole thing? I remember a bishop asking this question in Brazil and Father Kramer gave the answer to him, no, Your Excellency, it was by means of mental reservation. What does he mean by this? Well, Antonio Sochi also deals with the same question. And he says that when they said they released the whole thing, they didn't say they released it all on June 26, 2000. They released it over time in other places. And so what happened was Pope John Paul II, for example, in, in May 13th, 1982 said, can the mother with all the force of love that she fosters in the Holy Spirit and desires everyone's salvation, can she remain silent when she sees the very basis of her children's salvation undermined? The Pope answers his own question, no, she cannot remain silent. But where did she speak about the basis of our under salvation being undermined? It's in the secret. He's telling us that the faith is being undermined, that is from within, and that it's in the secret. In 84, Cardinal Ratzinger himself said, the secret concerns the dangers to the faith and to the life of the Christian and therefore the world. He's telling us that the whole world is in peril and that Christians, meaning Catholics, are gonna go to hell because of faith. they're gonna lose their faith. This is releasing the secret, but they didn't say this exactly is the secret. You have to take their speeches, put them together and figure it out. It's about the mass, it's about the council, it's about the faith, 
That's what the secret's about. But they dare not say it directly. But they did say it here and there, and you piece it together, and you get to know the secret. And so, strictly speaking, well, we did tell you the whole secret, but not on June 26, 2000. We told you pieces here and there, but we didn't identify it to you when we gave you these other pieces that it was a secret. We have another piece of that, which we find, for example, in the Pope's book on May 13, 2000, when he said, the tale of the dragging, dragging, down a, dragging down a third of the stars of heaven. Well, when you know the reference, the stars of heaven referred to are the Catholic clergy. That's Pope, cardinals, bishops, and priests. And when you have a third of those stars, a third of the cardinals, a third of the bishops, a third of the priests, or whatever actual combination to make a third, dragging down and working at the service of the devil, that's powerful stuff. That's in the secret. And the Pope makes a reference to that. Now, I won't be surprised if the actual text, when it finally does get released, does make reference to the actual passage of chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. In fact, Paul VI, when he went to Fatima in 67, again referred to the same chapter, chapter 12 of the Apocalypse. Why that passage? Every time they go there, they talk about that. It's got to be in the secret. And that's why they can say it's been released. But it's really not exactly what should be said because our Lord said in Scripture, He said, let your words be yes for yes and no for no. Anything else comes from the evil one. In his book, The Fourth Secret of Fatima, Antonio Sochi, the leading Italian journalist and television host, concludes, there exists a fourth secret of Fatima, or rather, a part of the third secret, evidently what follows the words of the Madonna interrupted by etc. Sochi's book is a bombshell. This is a leading public intellectual in Italy. He has his own television show. He has personally hosted press conferences for both Cardinal Ratzinger and Archbishop Bertone, who at the time was no less than the secretary of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. This is a witness of unimpeachable integrity. Furthermore, Sochi admits in his book that when he began his investigation, he totally accepted the Vatican party line on the meaning of the third secret, only to be totally convinced that there was in fact a text that has yet to be published. As he puts it in the book, I had to surrender to the evidence. Once he began to study the case, he had no choice but to conclude, as others have concluded, that there is indeed a missing text. And this is a tremendously favorable development for the effort to discover the truth in this matter. But Sochi's book goes even further. His investigation has uncovered the direct testimony of the personal secretary of Pope John XXIII, Archbishop Loris F. Capovilla. According to Capovilla, Pope John's successor, Paul VI, called for and read the contents of this envelope on June 27, 1963. However, the Vatican Commentary on the Vision, published in June 2000, states that Paul VI read a text pertaining to the secret on March 27, 1965, nearly two years later. Sochi recounts that when an Italian journalist, Soledeo Ballini, asked Capovilla whether this meant that there were two envelopes containing two different texts pertaining to the secret, Archbishop Capovilla replied in Italian, Perla Punto, which translated means precisely so. In his book, Il Quarto Segreto di Fatima, The Fourth Secret of Fatima, Antonio Sochi, a great Italian journalist who has never been polemical against the Vatican in his previous positions, and who as well is personally known by the currently reigning Pope and esteemed by the current Secretary of State, Tarcisio Bertone, reports in a perfect and absolute literal and exact manner the personal confirmation that Archbishop Capovilla, Emeritus Confidential Secretary of Pope John XXIII, gave to me about the existence of two different texts of the Third Secret of Fatima. On May 10, 2007, Cardinal Bertoni published his response to Sochi in a book-length interview entitled The Last Seer of Fatima. Rather than directly responding to the challenges posed by Dr. Sochi, the Cardinal instead resorted to personal attacks against the man himself. Throughout the writing of his book, until the present, Cardinal Bertoni has refused to speak with Sochi, despite the fact that Sochi and Bertoni previously had been on friendly terms. Dr. Sochi easily refuted Cardinal Bertoni's book in a newspaper article dated May 12, 2007. Unable to let the matter rest, 
On May 31, 2007, Cardinal Bertoni appeared on the popular Italian television program Porta a Porta to deny the premise of Sochi's book. But Sochi was not allowed on the program, even though other journalists who knew far less about Fatima appeared on the set to interview the Cardinal. Sochi later learned from the television station that Bertoni made it clear that he wanted no challenges to his position on the broadcast. Dr. Sochi refuted Cardinal Bertoni's TV presentation on June 2nd, just two days later in a second newspaper article. On September 21st, 2007, Cardinal Bertoni held another event for the official presentation of his book, The Last Seer of Fatima, held here at the Pontifical Urbaniana University in Rome. We are here in front of its entrance. This event was attended by government dignitaries, bankers, Vatican prelates, and members of the press. In an attempt to once again have his questions answered by the Cardinal, Antonio Sochi, I was with him here that day, attended the event. After he learned from the director of the Vatican press office that the Cardinal would not allow any questions to be asked of him, Sochi and I proceeded to the main entrance of the auditorium, hoping to ask a question of the Cardinal on his way in, before he would enter inside the Aula Magna for the presentation. On the arrival of the Cardinal, seeing Sochi at the entrance of the Aula Magna, Bertoni changed his route and darted in another entrance. When the journalists present saw what had happened and Bertoni's behavior, they immediately questioned Sochi about the controversy. At this moment, Vatican security quickly descended upon us, demanding Sochi to stop speaking with the press. Sochi replied that he was a journalist and was not causing a problem for anyone. It was a public venue, and he had every right to be there and to talk with his colleagues. But the security then drove us by force from the university. They scratched one of my fingers while taking my cell phone by force from me. They demanded that I not record anything, something I wasn't doing anyway. Perhaps they were thinking of the cassette recording of my last conversation that I had with Archbishop Capovilla. That tape was in Sochi's briefcase, and on that tape, the secretary of Pope John XXIII confirmed explicitly that there is or there was an attachment to the secret published in 2000, and that attachment is still unpublished to this day. So why is the Vatican doing this? Why would the Vatican, are they, first of all, the, the amount of, of intellectual degeneration that had occurred to allow them to even present this as a plausible uh, scenario is absolutely shocking. But why would they do it? You know, forget why they think they can get away with it. <laughs> why would they do it? Because if the third secret is about a diabolical disorientation among the hierarchy, which is going to endanger the dogmas of the faith in many countries, this is obviously an indictment against the hierarchy who's allowed this to happen. If the third secret was warning the faithful that we were going to see a massive destruction of doctrine, a massive destruction of our liturgical practices, so that the great majority of Catholics would really lose the faith. If that's what the third secret was about, and if it added in the fact that perhaps the hierarchy was going to be involved in actually doing this, uh, well, if you were the Pope and you were <laughs> part of the whole situation, I don't think you'd want it revealed because immediately fingers would be pointed at you, aha, are you one of those people that Our Lady's warning us about? I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there were specifics about how this general apostasy and loss of faith would, would come about. would be very damning for the people in charge now because they're carrying it out. We can be very impatient with them. There are times we may feel anger with them, but do remember this, that the churchmen in Rome right now are reluctant to reveal the fullness of the third secret in the same way that those of us who are sinners 
would be reluctant to go into the town square and broadcast our own sins. We have made mistakes. Fortunately, we do not have the same burden on us. And no more than we would like to reveal something that told the world what terrible sinners we are. The third secret, I think, is being withheld by these men for that same reason. Now, Our Lady came to Fatima as an emissary from God, as an ambassador from God. So it's not Our Lady's message, really. It is God sending Our Lady to us with these dire warnings. If she is giving us dire warnings, we not only have the right to know, we have to know for our own good. The world at large have a right to know the third secret of Fatima because it is very clear when the world goes off track severely, not just Catholics, but the entire world, and the entire world was created by God and oriented to the end of being with God, so it concerns every soul born into the world, then God will, through a messenger, tell the world what it needs to know. The situation is at once so ludicrous and so tragic and so overwhelming that the ordinary Catholic trying to do the right thing looks at the church and is almost tempted to throw up his arms in despair and say, who am I? What can I do? Well, if the problem, as Sister Lucy has pointed out, is a diabolical disorientation, obviously the solution is a heavenly orientation. Okay? We have to turn away from, from the devil's direction and turn back to the direction of God, turn back to the direction of heaven. Now, obviously that direction is the one that has been pointed out by the Catholic Church through 2,000 years of her history. Uh, what every individual Catholic has to do is they have to more or less take a refresher course in their basic doctrine, go back to the catechisms. Our Lady of Fatima on October 13th said, I've come to warn the faithful to amend their lives and ask pardon for their sins. They must not continue to offend our Lord anymore because he's already too much offended. Certainly what we must do is amend our lives. Of course, we need to pray the rosary to get the graces we need to amend our lives and to stay on the right course. But we must amend our lives. That means avoiding the occasions of sin. That means doing our daily duty. Those are things Our Lady insists that we do. She also, on that same day, October 13th, held out the brown scapular and Sister Lucy tells us the rosary and the scapular go together. She wants all of us to wear the scapular as well as pray the rosary every day. And then she gave us a plan of following the first Saturdays, do certain things on the first Saturday of the month. That's all she asked of us, the lay people. She asked of the Pope and the bishops to consecrate Russia to her Immaculate Heart, all of them together at one time specifically Russia. Various consecrations have been done. This has been very garbled, uh, you know, by people trying to protect the hierarchy. Various consecrations have been done that have never followed what she said. Many believe that with the consecration ceremony of 1984, the Pope had finally acceded to the request of heaven, of Our Lady, that he consecrate Russia to her Immaculate Heart. It's very curious, if that is the case, that he never mentioned Russia. It is as if I were to make beef stew using a recipe that never mentions beef. The ultimate solution will be when the Pope enjoins the, bishop of the bishops of the world to consecrate Russia to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart with him in a specific ceremony. That will be, that will be the, the, the ultimate. But the means to regaining the faith and, and getting the grace for the Holy Father to eventually do that is for as many people to be worshiping in a truly Catholic manner as possible. Now, good liturgy drives out bad liturgy. For those who have the Catholic faith and those who are given uh, through the gifts of the Holy Ghost Catholic piety and have a sense for what is holy, they embrace the traditional liturgy. And when the traditional liturgy is made available to them, people flock to that. As Catholics, what can we do? the simple things we have always been told to do. Hold close to the faith, stay close to the sacraments, and pray, pray, pray. In Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, etc. By all indications, contained within that etc. are to be found great and terrible truths 
of utmost concern not only to Catholics but to all humanity. The whole truth is in the possession of those in the Vatican who have read the text of Our Lady's words and has been held there under lock and key since 1957. Clearly, in this time of unparalleled crisis in the Church and the world, with apocalyptic dangers looming over the whole human race, etc. is not enough. It is very clear that currently the officials in Rome are covering up the truth about the third secret of Fatima. The simple fact that those who should be proclaiming the message are hiding it means that they themselves are going to be led into a desperate condition. What that is, we do not, we do not know. But they will certainly suffer. They will be punished. We have been told nations will be annihilated. There is a time of great suffering at hand. And if the clergy go steer in the wrong direction, especially if they're heading towards heresy, uh, we have no obligation to follow them in that, in that deviation. And we do have an obligation to adhere to the faith and pass that down as we've received it. And therefore we have to uh, do what St. Vincent Lear said, that when the whole church would fall into apostasy at the same time, we must hang on to tradition, traditional faith, traditional practices. That way we will the, the Church is Catholic, not just because it's universal, that is all over the space of the, the whole world, but it's Catholic because it's universal in time. It's the same faith, the same practices from the time of Christ to the end of time. And when everyone around us goes wrong, at least if we look to what our forefathers have done, we know that we're on the safe and solid ground. If you look at the history of the Rosary, it was given to the Church at a time when the Church was threatened with another diabolical disorientation, with the Albigensian heresy. It was the spiritual weapon in a crusade which actually took up real weapons. Uh, but this was the spiritual weapon Mary gave to again save us from another diabolical disorientation such as we're facing now. Sister Lucy points out that uh, Our Lady has given even greater efficacy to the Rosary in our times. So if it has been so singularly potent in previous ages, we have the promise of Our Lady that it's going to be even more powerful and more potent against evil and sustaining our life of grace in our, own, in our own age. All this knowing about the liturgy, the changes, the apostasy, the third secret of Fatima would be nothing if there weren't some, if it had nothing to do with the average person. If there were nothing we could do then it would be nothing more than a story, something we'd read in the National Enquirer or something like that. But it's not. The average person is not helpless. Remember, we're saved by faith and good works. And I apply this to everything in the church. The faith on the one hand, I apply to prayer, prayer and sacrifice, the rosary, the, most especially the rosary. Here's a prescription. Pray your rosary every day. Only Our Lady of the Rosary can help you. We need to pray the Rosary. Now, in the face of all this evidence of a cover-up, one might conclude that the situation is hopeless. Uh, the Vatican has apparently determined, or at least certain elements of the Vatican apparatus have determined, to suppress part of the Third Secret of Fatima, the part containing the words of the Virgin. And we have no way of knowing how to avert this disaster that's coming, so we should just sit there and wait for the end. But that isn't the case, because the Fatima prophecies are conditional. Yes, the annihilation of nations that Our Lady speaks of is predicted in the Third Secret of Fatima, but the Third Secret undoubtedly predicts the consequences of failing to do what the Virgin requested. As she said, if my requests are not granted, various nations will be annihilated. But if they are granted, what is predicted in the Third Secret can still be averted. And so what that means is it's still within the power of the faithful to avoid disaster by simply doing what the Virgin requests of us. And that would be honoring and obeying the Fatima message by practicing the first Saturday devotion, praying the rosary daily, seeking always the consecration of Russia, which will be the pivotal event, which when it occurs, as Sochi points out in his book, will avert disaster and transform the entire world. So there remains hope because the Fatima prophecies are conditional. You have a right to know what that prophecy is. And the Pope has an obligation to give it to you. And you have a right to petition him. 
If you don't petition him, you have not done your duty to ask for it when you know you can. Because you need that information. You need it in order to save your soul from the apostasy that's so insidious around us right now. It is very clear that the third secret has something to do with that immense punishment which is coming, which draws nearer every day. The world must know what's in the third secret of Fatima because the world needs the opportunity to change its evil ways, to repent, to fall on its knees and beg for God's mercy. Our Lady warned at Fatima that if her requests are not heeded, then various nations will be annihilated. So, so, so whether someone's Catholic or not, they should have a very keen interest in the Fatima message and also uh, a keen interest that it be obeyed because the ramifications of not obeying the message is not just a Catholic issue. It has ramifications throughout the world. What nation can we say, can any one of us say, well, my nation's not going to be annihilated? It, it concerns everybody. The Catholic churchmen have a duty to tell the Catholic faithful what is contained in the third secret without smokescreen, without obfuscation, without gimmicks, without games, without the nonsense that has gone on in the previous years. The time has come and the third secret must be revealed in its fullness. We have been warned. All of the evidence, including revelations by the highest Catholic churchmen, tells us that the third secret of Fatima prophesizes an unprecedented crisis in the church and a divine punishment of the whole world. The current Pope, when he was then Cardinal Ratzinger, admitted that the secret concerns the dangers to the faith and the life of the Christian, and therefore the world. If the message of Fatima is to be believed, and the church itself says the message is worthy of belief, unless we alter our present course, millions will lose the faith and millions more will die.